aspect of it. It's meant to be kind of a deep dive for those of you who are using Release 8 or thinking of going to Release 8 and, uh, and want to take it, uh, and want to take advantage of this functionality. So from a, for our agenda, what we're going to do is first just kind of give a, an overview of, in Release 8, what does the risk module uh, look like? As many of you know, Release 7 and earlier versions had our risk module as a part of, um, of using uh, P5 or P6, whichever it may be. But it maybe was lacking some of the functionality that a lot of users wanted. So we're going to start off with looking at an overview uh, of what the risk module is and some of the functionality that we see uh, in the risk register. Then I will spend uh, a good amount of time, uh, for those of you who are administrators, talking about some of the things that will need to be uh, used in the setup of the risk module uh, that need to be performed by the administrator. And then we'll also take a, a pretty good look at how the risk scoring feature works. So, uh, and at the end of that, we will open it up to uh, to some questions. And, uh, and, and as Dan mentioned, we'll be compiling our questions and getting back to everybody uh, with the answers to those questions. But first, let's start off with what is the uh, risk module comprised of in P6. And the key point here is that the risk functionality that we find within P6 RE is a risk register. Um, not to be confused with a risk simulator, but a risk register. And the real feature that we want to grab is that the risk register is going to allow you to identify, prioritize, and track risks that are associated with projects. The one thing we'll see which I like is now in release 8 when we are talking about using risk module, I have a lot more fields at my disposal for tracking things like cause, effect, um, items where I was limited to one field before, now I have specific areas within the risk module that I can type in free-form text to make sure that I convey a good, clear thought about what's going on as far as the risk on a particular project. And, we'll, um, and it contains features for calculating an overall risk score. So as we identify the risk, we will be able to put in uh, certain parameters that will arrive at a risk score, and we'll talk about those in a good amount of detail. As I mentioned earlier, the risk feature has been around in the application for quite a long time. And here's what we see as the basic uh, functionality of what you have in earlier releases prior to release 8, where we have uh, the ability to uh, put in a little bit of information. But if you were not looking at it, if your project did not have either units, if you were not tracking resources or any kind of expenses or costs on the project, there was really not a whole lot of information that you could take from this. And it's pretty flat, pretty straightforward as to what it does and, and also what it does not do. But in release 8, they have enhanced this module to increase the functionality and be able to provide uh, a good amount more information. As we can see just by looking at the screen, uh, it is much more rich, it is much more, uh, I have much more information to display in terms of columns um, and, and data as well in this particular view. Now, not to be confused, Primavera does offer a full uh, risk analysis application, Primavera Risk Analysis, and this is the application um, that is more uh, providing a risk simulation uh, and a more, uh, a more quantitative risk analysis that can provide you a, uh, a score based on uh, duration range of uh, most likely uh, average and so on and so forth. But, this is the application for risk analysis, and this is different than what we're going to be looking at in release 8 as a risk registry. As I mentioned earlier, one of the things I like about the new risk uh, capabilities in release 8 is the ability to track a lot more information. If you recall, perhaps the slide we looked at on release, uh, what the risk module looked like in version 7. What we see now is on the risk details, when I uh, assign a new risk, I have the ability to track a lot more information, such as response plans. I can associate risk to activities in the current schedule. But also, I can have uh, rich text fields for description, cause, effect, and then even notes that might be applicable to the risk. So all in all, what I'm now able to do is, when I'm tracking my risk for a particular project, I have the ability now to input more information and allow uh, other users of P6 of that project to identify and see more information that's related to risk on a particular project. Here's 
just another view and example of the, we talked about there's a, a good amount more information that I have available. And this is a screenshot that shows the different columns that I have available uh, in addition to the ones that I have shown there. So obviously what we see here are the ones that have a checkbox or the ones that we've chosen to display. And as you can see, uh, if you've looked at the release, uh, the risk register in earlier versions, this has been greatly enhanced to include more features and information that can create full views of the risk that they're associated with uh, with individual projects. So in order to get started, we're going to talk about some of the administration. So for those of you who are, in fact, uh, administrators of the system and want to utilize some of this functionality, uh, there's a few settings that we will need to uh, need to address first. So to access the, uh, the settings to administer the RIP, uh, under the administration menu, you select the enterprise data. And in this area is where we will create our risk categories, uh, thresholds, identify risk scoring matrices, and any user-defined fields that we might want to associate with our risk. So first, let's talk about risk categories. And risk categories are very simply uh, a hierarchical structure of data that allow me to classify risks. And the main features that we get from creating risk categories is I can create uh, unique categories based on my organization. And in the example here, we may have uh, risk categories for environment, uh, project management, contract, people, whatever my risks may be. And then when I assign these categories to risk, I have the ability now to group and filter my risk to create a more meaningful view for users uh, to look at the risk associated with a particular project. The next item that we will talk about are the risk thresholds. And what the risk thresholds mainly do is they facilitate the scoring uh, component of P6R8. So when we establish thresholds, in order to arrive at an overall score, I need to establish three different thresholds within P6. And the first being a probability, which is the likelihood of the risk occurring. The impacts, which are typically what are the potential cost impacts and what are the potential schedule impacts. And then also a tolerance for the risk, which is basically uh, how manageable we feel that the risk is going to be. And when we look at the tolerance threshold, this is where we are going to identify which uh, values rep should represent red, yellow, or green, or whichever we want. We'll talk about how to customize your PID, which is a short uh, shorthand for probability impact diagram. But in order to create a risk score or quantify our risk score, we will need to establish these thresholds within P6. So again, this is another view back in the, under the enterprise data in the section for risk. By selecting the thresholds here, we see the different types of thresholds. So by looking at the top part of the screen there, the currently the one that's expanded in this example is our cost impact by value. So I can create a cost, uh, a new threshold, and then down below, I have different levels of the threshold. And within these levels, I designate what value constitutes a significant cost impact, a uh, medium cost impact, or a low cost impact. And these are going to be what are used to aggregate the overall score by cost. And over on the right, we see the different levels. Right now, we have a, uh, a five level of potential um, of impact here. And we'll talk about how this is customizable. We can create things uh, you know, to, to different levels when I'm administering the system. So as far as our threshold levels, here's another example. Previously, we were looking at the threshold had a, a five levels um, of cost impact. Here's an example. We were setting our threshold for a probability, and I set the threshold to uh, the levels to be at two. So if I were looking to create a more simplified view of my probability, whether it's either a high or a low probability, I can set the different levels of my threshold and this way either have uh, maybe a more simplified way of, of calculating the risk, or I can go into as much detail as I, as I would like. And the values for my levels can range anywhere from 2 to 9. And these levels will be used in conjunction with our risk scoring matrix. So as we're learning about the levels here and how they are used 
in setting up our threshold. We'll see how this relates when we set up our overall scoring matrix. So once we have set up our thresholds, we then can look at the overall creating a risk scoring matrix. And in order to set up the matrix, we'll need three primary bits of information. Number one is we will need to give our matrix a, a name and then a size. And I have examples here, 5 by 5, 4 by 4. And what these different uh, numbers mean, these relate to the level of either my probability and the impact when I go to set up, uh, when I go to create my, uh, my, uh, my matrix. And then on the far right, we also can choose one of three different risk scoring methods, which we'll talk about uh, in some detail here later on. But here we see just an example of a new risk scoring matrix that I set up called the MTA risk scoring matrix, and it's a size 5 by 5, and I have assigned a probability threshold as well as specific cost and schedule uh, threshold as well as the tolerance. When we look at setting up our risk scoring matrix, the matrix size, as we talked about, is going to be dependent on the different levels of my of the threshold that I have established. So I tried to create this slide to maybe clarify how the, these two fields kind of interrelate. So when I create a new uh, risk scoring matrix, I have one here that's just called testing, and I've established the size to be 2 by 3, and that's probability uh, by impact. So when I click in the cell where it says probability threshold, only those uh, probabilities that go to two levels will be displayed. And then similarly on the right, when I go to select my impact threshold, only those which uh, go to three levels uh, will be displayed there and available. So if I want, if I set up a threshold that has five different levels, I would need to make sure that when I set up my scoring matrix size, that it is uh, 2 by 5 or 3 by 5, whichever it's going to be. That is the only way that I can then access the proper threshold to include it in my risk scoring matrix. Using the risk tolerance threshold, we can use to determine the color values that are going to be displayed in our probability impact diagram. So when we set up our tolerance, we, here we have our risk uh, threshold. We have a tolerance that is three levels, and this is up in the upper right hand. Uh, portion up here. And then down below, under my levels, I can designate a particular color. So in this particular instance, I've designated that anything with a score greater than three will be shown as red. Anything uh, two will be an orange or amber, and anything less than two will be green. And then when I plug these into my risk scoring matrix, I can see that two are going to be, values of two will be represented as green, three will be the orange, and then anything above three will be displayed in red. So I do have control of your organization does use a, uh, a more standardized way of looking at uh, certain colors to identify a particular level of risk. That can be conveyed here when you're setting up your scoring matrix. In okay, so now that we've set up the administration part of it and we are ready to go, how do we begin to assign the risk to projects. And I can do this in one of two locations within P6 EPPM. I can assign a risk very quickly and easily in the project view. Uh, on the details section, I can uh, include a new risk, but I will only be able to input some of the basic information uh, related to the risk. Or I can enter uh, a new risk in the risk view, and when I have a project open and I select the risk view, I can add not only the basic risk information, but I can get into the other details, such as our response plan, uh, cause, effect, and that kind of information. So let's just take a look at these two options. Here we see a screenshot where I have opened up uh, in EPPM. I'm on selected the EPS section, and I have selected the Johnsontown uh, Routine Maintenance Work Project. And then down below in my project details, I can select risk the plus sign and add in my basic information. I can assign a category, I can give it a name and an ID, and I can even go so far as to establish my uh, probabilities and impact here right in this particular view. 
when I open up the project and actually navigate to the risk module, the risk section within the project, I can then see more of the risk details. And so this is intended to kind of uh, reinforce the idea that when I then create a risk in this view, things like my response plan, uh, which activities in the schedule that this is going to apply to, cause and effect, and all of this uh, more detailed information I will have access to. And these details that we have highlighted uh, down there on the bottom are the elements that are not available when I just go to assign something simply in the EPS view. As we begin to enter information, I wanted to kind of show this slide relatively early that begins to show when we are using the EPPM uh, solution, this is an example of some of the outcome capabilities that you're going to have. And it's just a kind of some food for thought on the top is the overall dashboard. So here's where I might be looking at the risks that are for a particular group of projects and strategic programs. But I can choose to customize and display a certain columns. If I select where it says description here, there's a little icon. When I click here to expand, it will then show me what the description is. So I can click on any of these cause, effect, or notes and see the information that's been entered by our users. Also down below, I can see uh, the risks as well. And this is an example uh, of what is set up in the project workspace. And again, I can include different views. Uh, this particular one is an example of what I have set up for a couple of user defined fields uh, that can display. So graphically, I can show some information there. These information, this, these user defined fields are simple indicators that I can use to say, hey, uh, this is a, a something that we need to address, or these can have different values or different meanings, depending on how your organization is set this up. But I wanted to kind of put this out there that says once we put the information in, this gives you maybe an example of how your users or other project participants may consume that information. One of the things that uh, you may have noticed in some of the earlier slides is the idea of a risk exposure. And the risk exposure is a a uh, built-in calculation that is going to use uh, a combination of your probability of the risk occurring and the cost bit point. This uh, particular risk exposure uh, is something that is not necessarily calculated based on uh, detailed activities in the schedule, but it's a very high level um, of what the potential impact cost-wise could be should this risk occur. And the nice feature about this is for those of you who are maybe looking at high-level schedules uh, where you don't have a lot of detail for cost loading uh, of the project, you can use this to, to arrive at a, at a general score and get a feel for just what kind of exposure cost-wise am I looking at for a particular uh, risk. And so for the example here, the uh, concrete supply chain constraint, what it's going to do is look at the cost midpoint. So we have a what is low cost impact, which has a range of $45,000 to $90,000. So the midpoint in that is $67,500. The probability midpoint, we have a, a high probability, which represents a 50 to 70 percent chance that will occur. So the midway point of that would be 50. So the way that the exposure field is calculated is it will take 50 uh, percent of $65,500 that gives us a total of 40500 So with very little information, I can quickly arrive at, depending on how accurate my, uh, my thresholds are that I have set up for cost and probability, I can get a rough idea of generally what kind of cost exposure we may have for a particular risk. Risk response plans. It's one thing to identify the risk. The next question that maybe organizations are going to ask is, what are we going to do about it? So once we have identified a risk for a project, we can create multiple response plans which represent different courses of action that the organization may want to take in order to deal with the particular risk. When we have multiple response plans, as item three indicates down below, only one can be uh, established as active. But mostly these can be used quickly to kind of uh, flush out what, what are the action items in our response plans that might be applicable and which one might be the best course of action uh, to do. If I am going to identify my response plans, I do have to choose one, and I can choose only one as an active response plan. 
So here we see an example of a sample of a response plan for our issue here that says our concrete supply is constrained. And when I click on the response plan, we have two possible responses. Number one is we can spend the contingency plan to get to the higher rate. And then you can see below that there is a action that says get approval to spend the project contingency plan. The other response plan we've identified is to contract with alternative suppliers. And in order to do that, we would have different action items listed below there to identify the suppliers, uh, put out an RFP, and, uh, and then select and issue a contract. And all of these items may take time, and I can associate a start and finish. What this allows me to do is have more uh, closely help with the, which would be the best response plan. What's going to take the most time? What has the most potential impact? And which might be the best course of action? So in my response plan, I can see that I have two. And then the checkbox on the left-hand side, I can select one that is going to be my active response plan. If I'm using a response plan and some of my uh, response plan actions relate to schedule items that I have, I can click on the uh, column for activities. And when I do that, it will open up all of my activities uh, grouped by WDF, and then I can select a particular activity that most closely aligns with the particular action item in the response plan. Uh, we've had questions before of can this uh, can I associate it with an overall WBF? And the answer is, for this, we are selecting individual activities that would be associated with the response plan action item. At a higher level, at the overall risk level, I can associate one risk with multiple activities that are in the schedule as well. So here is an example where we are looking at risk ID R004, which is poor ground condition. And with that particular risk, there is, it looks like, to be seven different activities in the current schedule that are potentially impacted by or associated with this particular risk that, I, that I've identified. So as we can see down below, once I associate this particular risk to activities in the schedule, I can look at items such as remaining duration, what is the status of the activity, uh, are these activities have cost, so I can maybe make more of uh, a better judgment of how much uh, this risk should be uh, either pushed out to management or how aggressively I need to pursue a potential response plan. Okay. Earlier we looked at the, when we were setting up, uh, when we were looking at how to set up the risk scoring matrix, uh, we looked at the different scoring methods. And there are three primary methods that the, will be used to to arrive at an overall risk score. And their highest impact, average impact, and average individual impact. So we're going to go through these one by one with an example so you get a sense of what T6 is going to do and how it arrives at the overall score. Because one of the things that is going to certainly happen should you uh, choose to implement this for a project or a program is when you do decide to show the risk score, the question is going to be how does this score uh, arrived at. So let's look at these uh, one by one. What we have set up here is just a quick sample where I'm going to have two risks identified. There's a risk ID 375 and then one that I just have titled uh, new risk. These are just risk one and two. And in the next three examples, all of this information for probability, by schedule impact, and cost impact is going to be maintained. And we're going to look at how T6 will look at the same information to arrive at unique project scores. So the first one we're going to look at is the risk score using the highest impact. And what it will do in the highest impact is, based on the probability, it's going to find the highest impact, and whichever that may be, that is going to be what's used to arrive at the overall score. So on our top item here, risk number one, we have a significant probability. So I know that my score for this risk is going to come off of this particular line here, and it's going to be one of these values in my impact diagram. This particular risk has a low schedule impact, which carries a value of 6, but a significant cost risk, which is 72. So from one extreme to the other, when we are using the highest impact to score the risk, the overall score here is 72. And then similarly, for risk number two, 
we have a medium probability, and I have a high schedule risk, and a significant cost risk, but the significant cost risk for a medium probability is going to only give me a score of 24. So that's what's going to be represented here when we calculate the score. Using the average impact. When we use the average impact, we're going to use more of these values here uh, on a 1 through 5 from low to significant. So when we look again, and again, this is my same probabilities and impact listed up above, but now when we look at risk number one, I have a low schedule impact, which has a value of one, but I have a significant cost impact, which has a value of five. So what the application is going to do is it's going to say that total six, and I divide it by the number of impacts, which is two, which gives me a total of three. When I take what I have as severity 3, so my score is going to come out of this column here, my probability is significant, and that gives me a value of 18, and that's what's reflected here in the score. Similarly, for my risk number 2, I have a high schedule impact, which is a, here's a value of 3, significant uh, cost impact, so I have a total of 8, and I divide that number by my number of impacts, so I have a 4, and my probability is medium. So my uh, probability combined with the severity gives me a score of 12. And that's what is reflected here in my score for this particular item. Using the average individual impact, again, same metrics up on the top. This is going to use the actual values that are displayed in the probability impact diagram. So Again, starting with risk number one, we have a significant probability and a significant probability and a low schedule risk. And that has a series value of six in my probability impact diagram. The next one for cost has a significant probability and a significant cost risk, and that carries a value of 72. So again, I will add those two values together for a total of 78, divide that by the number of impacts, which is two. And that carries a score of 39. Down below on risk number two, again, I have a medium probability and a high schedule risk. So that is going to give me a value of six. And then I also have a medium probability and significant cost risk, and that's a value of 24. Add those together, I get a total of 30 and divide by two. And that is how we arrive at the overall risk score for this particular item. One of the uh, things that I've been asked is, is does this roll up, does this information roll up or aggregate at a project level? And natively it does not, but within P6, uh, within EPPM, by using calculated user defined fields, I can manually do a little bit of input and aggregate these to an overall group, such as a group of projects uh, uh, that, I, that I happen to select. So in this particular uh, example, I created a few project level uh, calculated user defined fields and used a formula and a setting to arrive at a metric. But what I have here is an overall score, and this is just a sum of all the risks associated with the project. I can divide that by the overall number of risks, and I get an average. And I, in my calculated user defined field, I can uh, assign this average or the score um, a, a metric based on what the value is. So maybe something greater than 20 would, uh, would be displayed as red, something less than 10 would be green, and something between 10 and 20 maybe is a yellow. But this is a quick way that I can set these fields up, and the only thing I would really have to modify are these two elements right here, and I can simply mirror this column one to the other, and then all I simply need to know is how many risks are associated with the project, and then this screen can be here. In this way, if people log in and see the EPS view, we can get a very quick look at what, how many risks and what the maybe general uh, overall risk is for a program when we roll. One of the things that when I was kind of going through and, and beginning to, to look at the risk module is the probability impact diagram. And I wanted to know, well, could I customize this? And, and I found this particular screenshot and just doing some research over the internet. 
uh, of a typical 5x5 five five matrix. And different from what we saw in P6 is where that matrix went to 72. This one only goes from you know, 1 to 25, which in a 5x5 five five, uh, matrix makes a lot of sense. So what I wanted to point out here is that I can basically, if, if, this, if this particular screen is how your organization likes to view their risk by different levels, uh, in the different severities, I can mimic this in P6 by creating a five-level tolerance, and then in the probability impact diagram down below, you can see I can click directly in these cells and put in the values that I would like. So maybe the default might go from 1 to 72, but I do have the capability to open up the probability impact diagram and put in the values that are unique to my organization that's more meaningful, and then within my tolerance threshold that I established, I can identify the different colors as to what should represent as red, what should represent as yellow or green, uh, depending on how many different ones, uh, different colors that I want to use in my chart. Now, a lot of people have expressed an interest that says, hey, we want to just kind of keep things simple, and I do not have to use uh, the scoring features. A lot of people maybe just want to track their risk uh, and a lot of the text information, and I have the complete capability to do that. Uh, here's an example of uh, a risk associated with the project, but they do not necessarily use any particular scoring matrix. So over on the far hand, on the far right side, we see the risk scoring matrix, and these are blank. But by having some user-defined fields that are indicators that I can control. Uh, I can use user-defined fields to put in basic information, but really the takeaway here is that I can show all of my information, such as cause, effect, uh, description. I can convey a lot of information that my stakeholders might find useful in tracking a risk and not have to go through the rigor that's required in order to arrive at to, to, to score these particular risks. So this is something that can be used by anybody right away. For those of you who are using release data or thinking of upgrading, putting in place something that is as simple as this that can say uh, high-level information, this is just very easy to do, and it takes a lot of the pressure off the uh, administrative functions that need to take place. This is very simple, it's quick, and it's easy to do, uh, and can be done by anybody who is using P6 release. So just to summarize what we've been through, the risk module uh, provides a risk register for use of the P6 release date. Access to the functionality that we've looked at here is available within the ePPM solution or the P6 web. The functionality, notice that none of my examples or screenshots are resident with uh, the P6 client application or your optional client. In order to use the risk scoring matrix for any particular project, we need to set up our risk threshold and administer. And the main uh, goal when using this is to view and communicate risk information effectively for all project stakeholders. But the advice really uh, and the takeaway from this, for those of you interested in using the risk features, is to start out simple. Build your knowledge of the application and what it does, as well as your organization's goals in, uh, in measuring and quantifying the risk. And then create custom solutions that meet your needs, whether it includes the scoring matrix or whether it's simply tracking the information. This is something that has a lot of capabilities, and I encourage users to start out simple, begin using the application, putting in the basic information such as cause and effect, things that people can use, and then gradually grow into the functionality where we want to assign uh, our probabilities and thresholds to arrive at an overall score, so that this can be an evolving process that needs your organization in managing risk associated with the project. With that, do we have any questions? We did have a couple of questions that did come in, Brian, and uh, actually you uh, just answered the first one, but uh, I'm going to ask it again uh, just to quantify it. Uh, is this only available in the web version, and if it is available in the client, how much functionality is there, if any? I, if it, uh, in the optional client, 
it is not available. Uh, if you are using P6 Professional, uh, a lot of this functionality is, uh, is likely not available. Uh, other than maybe to use some of the uh, description information. But the, the capabilities that we've uh, shown today are resident in the EPPM or web application. The next question we have is, does this tool replace Primavera Risk, formerly Pertmaster? Uh, no, it does not. If you recall one of the slides we had from earlier, uh, the, it, it, it does not. What we are looking at here today, what is NT6 EPPM, is what I would call a risk register. And the risk register's primary functionality is to identify, here are the risks that we have associated with the project, and I can put a, a kind of a rudimentary uh, score that uh, that assesses how uh, how quickly uh, how you know should we deal with this risk. Uh, per mask or the primavera risk analysis does more of the uh, risk simulation. It will do the iterative calculations of the schedule based on durations of uh, most likely, least likely, and the uh, uh, I can't remember the term, most likely, uh, optimal, or uh, least likely. But it will use those calculations and arrive at a P number. That is a separate application that you're referring to uh, as proof of error risk analysis, or what used to be called per master. So yes, it is a separate uh, proof of error application, and that is not part of the uh, the next question we have is, will this information somehow export to Pertmaster or Primavera Risk? Will it export? Yes. Uh, to Primavera Risk. Uh, I have not tested that, but I believe I have uh, seen information that says there is interoperability between um, between uh, Primavera Risk Analysis and P6 EPPM. So I believe that feature is uh, I believe there is some interoperability, but I have yet to model connecting those. But uh, I would say uh, a very good chance that, yes, there is some you know, connectivity if you are using those. Can you associate the cost exposure to the ETC in Primavera? To the ETC. The cost exposure field that we looked at is, uh, is manually uh, calculated. If you wanted to do that, uh, my guess is that you would have to do that manually. So what you might do is you could take that uh, the cost that is on the exposure and uh, export that to Excel and then manually take that information and update an estimate to complete for you know, business certain activity or whether there's not a WDS summary type of activity. Uh, you could do it, but it would have to be a manual process. That exposure won't natively link to uh, an activity. The next question we have kind of touches base on uh, what we talked about just before with the export to Pertmaster or RISC. Uh, will the, this RISC register uh, import into RISC, or do I have to recreate it in Primavera RISC? Again, I think there, uh, there's some interoperability you connect the, uh, the risk analysis uh, to it. So, um, you know, it's a good question that I would have to, you know, have to try to model. Um, but I would not think you would have to create separate ones. If you had a project uh, that was linked or exported from either P6 into the Primavera Risk Analysis tool, uh, I would imagine you would not have to recreate those, uh, those particular parameters. But, Again, that's something that would uh, I would need to uh, we would need to test. That is all the questions that were submitted, Brian. Okay. Okay. Great. Well, uh, well, thank you very much. I appreciate everybody's time today. And again, if you do have any other uh, questions, uh, Dan, do you want to let everybody know how to submit those, and we'll be following up with uh, responses, everyone. Sure. You can email me directly at dbeck at drmcnatty.com. Uh, we are also going to put together the follow-up that all registrants and attendees will receive, which will include the question and answers log. We are going to also forward a copy of today's slideshow presentation and a link to the recording of today's webinar that you can share with 
any coworkers or colleagues that you may think this information be, may be relevant to. And I expect that to go out in the next uh, couple, three to four days. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So we thank everybody for joining our presentation today. Uh, next month we are going to be doing uh, a webinar on CM14 and logging reports within uh, BI Publisher. You can find the link in our webinar where you can register for it. If you cannot or have not received our webinar, you can contact me at dbeck at drmcnaddy.com, and I can send you that link where you can register for next month's webinar. Again, thanks everybody for joining us today, and hopefully we'll see you next month.